So as with volume one, Marx uses diagrams, and then you build off the diagrams he uses to help us understand what he's trying to, to tell us about capital. Um, and in this case, you look at the circuit and pick out three, what you call windows, but you also call them moments. I was just wondering why you use that word moments. Well, it has a sort of almost technical meaning of uh, uh, there is a moment where capital takes this form, i.e. it's the form of money. And then Marx uses this notion of metamorphosis. It goes from this form into that form. So there's a moment when it's money, then there's a moment when it's production, there's a moment when it's uh, a commodity. Uh, and each of those moments, it has different capacities and powers. The easiest way I would look at this is to say, um, for instance, geographical mobility. People like to talk about the, the mobility of capital. Well, in which moment is capital most mobile? Money form, a production form, or a commodity form? And I think you can see straight away that the money form. The money form is the one where it's most mobile. Commodity is the next most mobile, and the least mobile is production. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean that production doesn't move because we've seen massive reorganization of, of, of production, but uh, geographical distribution of production. But so I think this idea of a moment mm -hmm. where where capital is just for that moment frozen into that, that state. Mm -hmm. and, and and as Marx says, in that state it can only do what money does, or what production does, or what a commodity does. Mm -hmm. and, and so this notion of moment is, is to say that there are, there's a continuity, but there are different moments in that process, and then transformers, transformations occurring. So it's not a temporal thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a moment in a, in, in a process mm -hmm. uh, where you can define this is what capital is at this moment. Okay, you, uh, you should have read the first three chapters. I don't know if you have any reactions. Um, in terms of the metaphor the translator used about uh, deserts and oases, how much of it was desert and how much was oasis? Any reactions, responses? I mean, it's, uh, it's written in a very flat sort of style, and it's a bit hard to grasp sometimes exactly what he's into. And I'm going to have to do two things here, I think. One is, I want to give a, a general overview of what's going on, and uh, then come back uh, to the text to try and make some uh, sense of the, of the text in relationship to that. Uh, as you will see from the very first page, the, uh, the analysis here is rooted very much in uh, chapter 3 of uh, volume 1, which is the chapter on money. Um, and since that, as I mentioned last time, is the place where most people stop reading volume 1. Uh, it probably is not a, a good sign. But um, in effect, what Marx does here is, is, is a very simple operation, and it sometimes seems a little uh, banal. You look at the circulation process, which is laid out in where you have money, which is used to buy a commodity, and there are two kinds of commodities, labor power, means of production, those are then put together in production, which produces a different commodity, which contains the surplus value, which is then sold for money plus the increment of money, plus delta M if you like. Well, let me put that down here, plus delta M. And then you continue the process and say, well, okay, it comes back in, and once again we buy labor power, means of production, and we go to production, and we produce another commodity, and we go back to M plus another delta M, and we just keep on going. And this is the ongoing process of capital circulation. So 
So what Marx does is to stretch out what was the simple version of it here, and so let's see it moving on. And then what he does is to, in a sense, uh, put a number of frames on top of this. The first frame is this one, that is money going to money. And you look at this one. And this is the circuit of money capital. You then put another block around this bit and say this is circulation process of production capital. And then you put another block <coughs> around this one and say this is the circuit of commodity capital. So you decompose the general circulation process that you saw in chapter one into these three different circuits. And in a way what I think the question that's being asked is, well, from perspective of understanding how capitalism works, what do we see when we imagine that the only interesting circuit is the money circuit. And what do we imagine if the only interesting circuit is the productive circuit and the commodity circuit? In other words, these are three different windows through which you look upon the circulation process of capital. And then you say, what do I see through those windows? And you see something rather different. And what he wants to do is to say, well, Capital, which is the unity of these three circuits, has to be understood as being comprised of a moment of circulation a moment of production and another moment of circulation And the unity of all of these, he will then subsequently define as he goes on, this he calls the circuit of industrial capital. And I, I think that's a bit of an unfortunate term because by industry we generally have a certain conception, but really basically what he means is any activity which is generating surplus value uh, is incorporated here. And of course at the end of the day we are interested in industrial capital, but we're interested in the circulation of industrial capital as it incorporates all of the things we see about the circulation process um, through these separate windows uh, uh, when looking upon it. Now he takes up uh, a number of themes from volume one at this point. Uh, and he's specifically interested, I think, in three things, two of which he's very explicit about and one of which I think is a, a tacit question which I think uh, we should pay very serious attention to. Uh, the first theme he pays attention to, he takes the language from chapter three of volume one which is about metamorphoses, <laughs> the metamorphoses of capital. A metamorphosis is a change of form, and he's interested in what happens as capital changes its form from money to production to commodities and all the rest of it. And there are a couple of points here. One is the actual transition. How does it actually get from the money form into the productive form? But then what are its capacities and its characteristics and its powers, if you want to call it that, in the different states? I mean, what can it do as money, what can it do as production, and what can it do as a commodity, for example? 
Now the parallel here would be, you know, something like, uh, you know, the life cycle of a butterfly. A butterfly lays eggs, the eggs become a caterpillar, the caterpillar crawls around looking for food, makes a cocoon chrysalis, and, and eventually out comes the butterfly. Now, this is a typical metamorphosis, and I, I find this a very interesting uh, parallel for a variety of, of reasons. Because one of the things you immediately ask yourself the question is, well, what can a butterfly do that a chrysalis can't? And the answer is it can flit around all over the place. What can money capital do? It can flit around all over the place. What can production do? Well, production is pretty much, you know, like the chrysalis, it's stuck in a factory, it's stuck in place. So, uh, the only instance that Marx talks about where it's not like that is when you're producing transport, when you're producing change of location. What does the commodity do? It's like the caterpillar, it kind of crawls around looking for somebody to desire it and want it and consume it. Okay. In, the, in, in those completely different states, you see that different things are possible. Now, I, f I find this a very, very important idea. What it says to me in terms of geographical mobility, for example, money capital is highly geographically mobile. It, like the butterfly, it flits around the world. Production is not so mobile. I mean, yeah, it can move, but it's, it's, it's lumpy as it moves. The commodity is more mobile than production, but less mobile than money. So what happens in a world in which finance capital gets empowered vis-a-vis -vis commodity capital and production capital? What has happened over the last 30 years? Money capital has become very much more empowered. Okay. So just simply in terms of thinking about capital in its different states, I would say, look, <coughs> there are different capacities for geographical mobility. This is a terribly important thing in my own work, and if you want to understand globalization and all the rest of it, you can't understand it without thinking very much about the empowerment of finance capital and the empowerment of money capital. And the deregulation of the world's financial system, which began in the 1970s and picked up steam in the 1980s and the big bang of the you know, unification of the, the global stock markets in 1986, um, change the character, the power relations, if you like, between these different forms of capital in terms of geographical mobility. Before that, the butterfly character of, of, of money capital was largely curbed by the fact that you had capital controls and it couldn't escape the state power and all the rest of it in the 1960s. So that parallel, if you like, between you know, the life cycle of the butterfly and the, the life cycle of, of, of capital is, is, I think, a very interesting uh, parallel. Marx doesn't actually go into that, I go into that, you know, but I, and I find it really very, very interesting. What Marx is interested in is the, the specificity of these transformations, but also trying to say something about the inherent character of capital in these different states. It assumes a different guise, and we can elaborate on it. So Mark, that's what one of the things he's, he's really interested in here, is the metamorphoses. Connected with that, however, is a language <coughs> which frequently erupts in these chapters, which is a notion of potentiality of interruptions, of disruptions, of obstacles. If capital cannot move from this state to that state for some reason or other, and if it can't move, then it's no longer functioning as capital. Capital is value in motion. That was the definition in Volume 1. And if there's anything that actually interferes in these transitions, then you get disruptions. So he goes back to another theme that had been broached in Volume 1, which is the, the theme of, of crises. 
And I've circulated a couple of passages from Volume 1, which you can look at, uh, in this uh, sheet of paper, where he's very explicit about the following ideas. For instance, on, on 208 he says, he does this attack upon, say, his law, which says that there cannot be any general overproduction because every sale is a purchase, and every purchase is a sale. And Marx kind of says, you know, just because I've got money, I may decide to hang on to the money. There's nothing that says, because I've got this money at the end, that I have to go across this divide. I don't immediately have to take my money and plough it back in. I can sit there, I can hoard it. And if we all hoard money, then the system breaks down. So he then kind of says on the next page, these independent and antithetical processes form an internal unity. And that is to say that also the internal unity moves forward through external antitheses. These two processes <coughs> lack internal ind independence because they complement each other. Uh, hence, their external independence proceeds to a certain critical point. Their unity violently makes itself felt by producing a crisis. There is an antithesis, imminent in the commodity, between use value and value. Now this question of the antithesis between use value and value, remember that. It's going to become more and more important in this volume. Between private labour, which simultaneously manifests itself as directly social labour, and a particular concrete kind of labour, which simultaneously counts as merely abstract universal labour. And he then kind of says, the antithetical phases of the metamorphosis of the commodity are the developed forms of motion of this imminent contradiction. These forms therefore imply the possibility of crises, though no more than the possibility. For the development of this possibility into a reality, a whole series of conditions is required which do not yet even exist from the standpoint of the simple circulation of commodities. So, one of the questions that then comes out is, are we ever, are we more clear at the end of this exposition as to where crises might come from than we were at the beginning? In other words, does Volume 2 actually make more concrete what the possibility of crises might be? Unfortunately, it seems to me, Marx is not anywhere near as uh, wildly interesting as he is when if you turn the page and look at what he says on 236 in Volume 1, when he's very explicit about the nature of a monetary crisis, in which the ongoing chain of payments has been uh, fully developed, along with an artificial system for settling them. Whenever there is a general disturbance of the mechanism, no matter what its cause, money suddenly and immediately changes over from its merely nominal shape, money of account, into hard cash. Profane commodities can no longer replace it. The use value of commodities becomes valueless, and their value vanishes in the face of their own form of value. The bourgeois, drunk with prosperity and arrogantly certain of himself, like the Wall Streeters over the last twenty years, has just declared that money is a purely imaginary creation. Commodities alone are money, he said, but now the opposite cry resounds over the markets of the world, only money is a commodity. As the heart pants after fresh water, so pants his soul after money, the only wealth. In a crisis, the antithesis between commodities and their value form money is raised to the level of an absolute contradiction. He's much more lively about, you know, crisis formation in Volume 1 than he is in Volume 2. You don't, there are some passages which get a little bit close to this in, here in Volume 2, but for the most part, it's rather a flat kind of uh, commentary on where the possible blockages, disruptions, and antitheses might exist within this process. And by separating out, looking at the money form, the productive form, and the commodity form, we can see better where those disruptions might come from. But in a sense, what we end up with, I think, is a whole set of different possibilities. Uh, whereas uh, the possibilities are only vaguely hinted at, we can now locate them through the Volume 2 analysis more precisely. But the locating of them as being more precise still doesn't tell us why you might have crises. It's still about the world of possibilities. 
not about, well, it's inevitable or it's necessary or something of that kind. So the metamorphosis question and the crisis formation question is, I think, uh, sort of overtly uh, very much uh, in the forefront of what the discussion is about. The third thing that I think is going on here, <coughs> which is Marx is grappling with the question of what is the essence of capital? What is, what is capital really about? I mean, people kind of sometimes will ask me, you know, well, what is capital? What are you talking about? And I you know, wave my hand and sort of say, well, it's a process of circulation, you know. <laughs> it's, it's this process of circulation. It, this is, this is what capital is. It's value in motion. And they go, wow, value in motion, that's... But actually, what Marx does here is, is I think, start to give a, a slightly different answer than simply, well, it's a circulation process. Well, yes, it is that. But there are certain things about that circulation process that I think do add up uh, to a very distinctive notion of the essence of what capital is about. Now, Marx doesn't say he's... He's, doing, he's looking for that, but I think that actually through these chapters you, know, you can come up with some kind of definition uh, about this. So that's, if you like, the general framing of this, uh, of, of, of the first four chapters in particular. Do you, are, you, are you clear about what, what is going on here? Is this okay? I mean, when I first looked at it and sort of first read this, I thought to myself, well, this is a pretty banal thing to do, you know. I mean, you've got the circulation process and you just plump these kind of things over it. Like, what are you doing that for? Uh, what's the point of that? Well, uh, there is a point, uh, though it sometimes is a little bit hard to discern uh, from the text. So he, he kicks off then by saying, all right, I'm going to look at the money circuit. I'm going to look at this one. Now, if I, if I wanted to give a macro kind of view of this, it would, be go, it would go something like this. Everybody, I think, would tend to say that that is the circuit of capital. That money is you know, being used to make more money. Uh, that's what capital is about. Marx, I think, is very interested in disabusing of that, us of that. And saying, you're not grasping the fact, as he says at the end of the, this chapter on money capital, that this is an illusion. He doesn't use the word fetish, but he could. That is, money is the quintessential fetish form. And while it is perfectly true, as he says, that the capitalist is perpetually pursuing monetary gain, they're pursuing something which is not what the essence of capital is about. They're, if you like, pursuing its form of appearance, not it's reality. Why would we think that that is the form of capital as opposed to a productive circuit? I mean, that produ production is where surplus value is produced. Wouldn't we say that is the essence of things? Why wouldn't we? Well, Marx is going to question that one too. And Commodification. Isn't that what capitalism has always been about? Well, again, some serious questions to be asked about that. So he's trying, if you like, to unravel a little bit about what the concept of capital is and how best to understand it. And I think the answer he comes to is very important, and it's important politically. And while he doesn't make any noise about its political importance, uh, I am, so 
we will get to that in due course. So let's look more closely then at the circuit of money capital. On the first page, he introduces this general form of circulation. And then what he does is at the bottom of the page, he introduces these assumptions, which I mentioned last time, that we're not going to have any technological change, uh, we're going to examine it all in its pure state, all those kind of important assumptions that in a way limit his argument but at the same time uh, uh, make it easier to clarify what the nature of his argument is. And so he starts to look at the various links that are involved in this first stage. And the first link is this one, money going into commodities, but there are two kinds of commodities which are purchased, one is labour power and the other means of production, so we look at that in the first instance. But in the first paragraph he says something which I think is very interesting and important. What makes this particular act of commodity circulation a part of the whole process, with a well-defined function in the independent circuit of an individual capital, is not primarily the form of the act, but rather its material content. The specific use character of the commodities that change place with money. Now, I've argued that use value and the specificities of use value tend to be shunted aside in Marx's analysis. On the first page of Volume 1 of Capital he says to study the uses of things, that's the task of the historian. I'm not really interested too much in use values. But here he's interested in the specificity of use values and their material character. And that is actually going to make a very serious difference to the analysis. In fact, right throughout Volume 2, more attention is going to be paid to use value and the specificities of use value than was the case in Volume 1. And it has, I think, very specific consequences. Obviously what happens here is that money is being used to buy commodities, the means of production are the object, if you like, of the labour process, and that is, if you like, the subjective or personal aspect, and it's brought together in production. So this transition is about trying to get us to the point of production via this circulation kind of process. So the circulation process is a precursor of moving into production, and different issues arise as, as he says a little bit further down, about middle of 110, MC breaks up into ML, i.e. money into labour power, and M to MP, which is means of production. So the money is divided into two portions, one flows in this direction and the other flows in that direction. Once, of course, the capitalist has purchased those elements, they're in a position to move towards production and the moment of production, as he outlines at the bottom of 111. And he then says uh, at this point, so what we're dealing with here is the conversion of money capital into commodities which are going into production, and therefore it seems, in 112 he says this, money appears as the original bearer of the capital value, and hence money capital appears as the form in which capital is advanced. He then undermines that by saying, well, that's not really the case. As money capital, it exists in a state in which it can perform monetary functions. In the present case, the functions of general means of purchase and payment. Money capital, he says towards the bottom, does not possess this capacity because it is capital, but because it is money. What this means is that not all money is capital. Not all money which is being used to purchase labour power or means of production is capital. So this idea that money is capital, and that capital is money, 
gets somewhat undermined. As he goes on to say, on, on the other hand, the capital value in its monetary state can perform only monetary functions and no others. What makes these into functions of capital is their specific role in the movement of capital, hence also the relationship between the stage in which they appear and the other stages of the capital circuit. That is, money only becomes money capital by being embedded in this whole circulation process. If it is not embedded in this whole circulation process, it is not ca money capital. Now in the course of this, part of the money, of course, passes to the labourer. So at the bottom of 112 he says, when it does that, its capital character vanishes though its money character remains. What this says is that there's another circuit going on here, which is labour power is receiving wages, receiving money. Okay, so there's a flow of money to the labourer, and then is coming back and purchasing commodities. And this is a CMC kind of circuit. So the labourer is not in an MCM circuit, but in a CMC circuit. You start with your commodity, which is labour power, and you end up buying the commodities that allow you to live, the wage goods. But notice, the money then flows back into this circulation process. And that, as I mentioned last week, starts to become an issue. How much of it flows back into here and therefore provides the money to realise the value which is in the commodity. But when it's in this loop, it's no longer functioning as capital it's functioning simply as money. Even though it re-enters the circulation process. So a part of it goes out of the circulation of capital, and as he says on the top of 113, the worker spends the money thus received bit by bit on a sum of commodities that satisfy his needs on articles of consumption. The overall circulation of his commodity thus presents itself as LMC, or CMC if you just want the labour as a commodity, in which there are two links, one is labour into money and the second is money into the commodity. And then he says, i.e. in the general form of simple commodity circulation, CMC, where money figures simply as an evanescent means of circulation, as merely mediating the conversion of one commodity into the other. But, he then says, the purchase of labour power is generally regarded as characteristic of the capitalist mode of production. That is, the fact that wage labour exists will be seen as the specific character of a capitalist mode of production. But he then goes on to say, but this is in no way for the reason just given, because the purchase of labour power is a contract of sale. And he then goes on to talk about the wage. He goes on in the next page, having talked about this, when he says, but money appears very early on as a buyer of so-called services, without its being transformed into money capital, and without any revolution in the general character of the economy. So there can be buying and selling of labour power, without there being the circulation of capital. Just because you see the buying and selling of labour power doesn't mean you're in a capitalist society or there's a capitalist capital-labour relation. And actually that's still the case. I mean, if I pay a kid in my building two days a week to walk my dog in the afternoon, this is not the circulation of capital. Right? This is wage labour in a sense. And payment for services of some kind is a feature of pre-capitalist societies. So the fact that you see some sort of contract going on of that sort 
doesn't say, ah, oh, there's a labour market, therefore this is capitalism. The labour market may be a necessary condition for there being capitalism, but simply the labour market is not a sufficient condition. Now, what then happens is that 114, Marx kind of says, by way of this first money into commodities, labour and means of production, the capitalist affects a connection between the objective and the personal factors of production insofar as these factors consist of commodities. Now, on the next page, he then talks about the fact that this can only work as capital if, he says about the middle of 115, the class relation between capitalist and wage labourer is already present, already presupposed. The moment that the two confront each other in the act, money into labour power. It's a sale and a purchase, a money relation. But what is presupposed in it, he says, is that the buyer is a capitalist and the seller a wage labourer. And this relation does in fact exist because the conditions for the realisation of labour power i.e. means of subsistence and means of production are separated as the property of another from the possessor of labour power. And he then goes on to talk about this nature of this class relation, which of course rests on what in volume one is called primitive accumulation, in which labourers have been dispossessed of access to the means of production, so 116 he kind of says, this fact implies the occurrence of historic processes through which the original connection between means of production and labour power was dissolved. He then goes on to talk about the means of production. The capitalist has to buy means of production. Which means that there must already be in existence a market selling means of production. This whole thing cannot happen if you cannot go out and buy means of production. So, so what's very interesting in the next page or two is that it is a precondition for the circulation of capital, that there be well-developed commodity markets, both for wage goods, so the labourers, when they've got money, can go out and buy the things they need. If there's no, if there's no market out there that they can go to to buy what they need, then why would they need the money? They couldn't spend it. So you need a sophisticated market system producing wage goods and selling wage goods, already in existence, and you need a sophisticated commodity production system so that the capitalist can go out into the marketplace and buy means of production. So we then look at the second stage. Now, <coughs> the second stage really constitutes a form of consumption, what Marx calls productive consumption. There's going to be the productive consumption of labour power and the productive consumption of means of production. This movement from the state where the capitalist is simply sitting there with labourers and with means of production, this movement has to be smooth. So he introduces, bottom of 118, he says, the movement presents itself as M into C, L, M, M, P, dot, 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 P, the dots indicating that the circulation of capital is interrupted. It's going to go into its chrysalis form. <laughs> and, and, and that's an interruption. As far as, as far as the money capitalist is concerned, it's just a pain in the ass. I mean, why do you have to go through this? Wouldn't it be much nicer just to go from money to money? But no, you've got to go through this, all well, this chrysalis stuff. 
And it's an inter from the standpoint of money capital, it's an interruption. What he does is to go back over this stuff about there has to be a, a market for wa of wage goods uh, and uh, the relation to the labourer, as he says about the middle of 119, uh, the labourers must constantly encounter the necessary means of subsistence in purchasable form, i.e. in the form of commodities. Thus this situation in itself demands a high degree of circulation of products as commodities, i.e. commodity production on a large scale. As soon as production by way of wage labour becomes general, commodity production must be a general form of production. Assuming this to be the case, commodity production in turn brings about an ever-growing division of social labour, an ever greater specialisation of the products produced as commodities by particular capitalists, an ever greater division of complementary production processes into independent ones. That is, Marx is hinting at the, his idea of a historical process in which capitalist production gets hold in certain ways, but then proliferates and gradually colonizes many of these other elements. Then the same is true, however, about means of production. This is the bottom of the paragraph 119. The material conditions of commodity production confront him, that is the capitalist, to ever greater degree as the products of other commodity producers, as commodities. So not only do you need a class of wage labourers, but you need a class of capitalist commodity producers. And as this begins to develop, he says on top of 120, all of this has a destroying and dissolving effect on all earlier forms of production, which being preeminently aimed at satisfying the direct needs of the producers, only transform their excess products into commodities. It makes the sale of the product the main interest, at first without apparently attacking the mode of production itself. This was, for example, the first effect of capitalist world trade on such peoples as the Chinese, Indians, Arabs, etc. Once it has taken root, however, it destroys all forms of commodity production that are based either on the producer's own labour or simply on the sale of the excess product as a commodity. It firstly makes commodity production universal and then gradually transforms all commodity production into capitalist production. That is, there is a process of transformation going on here that Marx is setting up, in which preconditions are put into place, the preconditions allow something new to form, and that something new then alters all of the preconditions. And he goes on to talk about various economic epochs, and you know, then comes a little bit of rhetoric which, you know, a bit of relief from the rest of it, you know, all pursuit of commodity production becomes at the same time pursuit of the exploitation of labour power. But only capitalist commodity production is an epoch-making mode of exploitation, which in the course of its historical development revolutionises the entire economic structure of society by its organisation of the labour process and its gigantic extension of technique and towers incomparably above all earlier epochs. What in effect happens here is that labour power gets converted into the category of variable capital and means of production becomes constant capital of volume one. That is, they become forms of capital. And as forms of capital, they receive, as he says on 121, their specific social character only under certain particular conditions that have historically developed just as is only under such conditions that precious metals are stamped. What this does is to allow capital to enter into production, and of course it is there that surplus value is produced. That's the volume one story. Marx, thank goodness, doesn't actually repeat the whole volume one story all over again here, but you have to, if you, if you don't know the volume one story, you're in trouble here because this is exactly where surplus value is produced. The third stage is, all right, the commodity is now in existence and it's impregnated, as he says, with surplus value. Surplus value has been produced. It now exists in commodity form and commodities become commodity capital. And as he says in 122, 
In commodity form, capital must perform commodity functions. Money, you can only perform money functions. Production, you can only do production. And commodity, you can only do commodity functions. And as he says at bottom 123, the function of C prime is now that of every commodity product to be transformed into money and sold to pass through the phase of circulation CM. As long as the now valorized capital persists in the form of commodity capital is tied up on the market, the production process stands still. The capital operates neither to fashion products nor to form value according to the varying speed with which the capital sheds its commodity form and assumes its money form according to the briskness of the sale, the same capital value will serve to, to a very uneven degree in the formation of products and value. What Marx is now introducing is the idea that the speed of movement, the speed of this transition is important. It's timing, how fast it can happen. And that is something that's going to be taken up uh, later on, but note it's introduced here. So he says, towards the bottom of 125, main paragraph there, the surplus value C first came into the world within the production process. It is thus now entering the commodity market for the first time, and moreover in the commodity form. This is its first form of circulation, and hence the act of CM, which is C, which is the surplus value embodied in the commodity, to the delta M, <coughs> this, act, this piece of the transition becomes very significant. But there's a shift here. To begin with, you can't split a commodity into, you know, just sell this piece and not this piece. In other words, there's unity in the commodity. On the other hand, you can say at the end of the day, oh, this amount of money belongs to the production process and this is my profit. In other words, you can't take a commodity and say, okay, here's the commodity and here's the car and this bit of the car is the, is the surplus value. You can't do that. They're not separable in the commodity. So in the commodity form, there are limits in how you can identify the surplus value. In the money form, however, you can identify the surplus value. You can say, all right, I got my original money back, this is equivalent to this, and I've got the delta M. And I can see how much surplus value there was there. You can't actually see how much surplus value there is in the commodity until it goes into its monetary form. And one of the consequences of this is that when it gets into its monetary form, as Marx points out, the direct connection with P, with, with production, vanishes. You no longer see anything about production. You know, when Marx talks about production being the hidden abode, well, it's a hidden abode where all these things go on inside of the chrysalis, but by the time you get to be the butterfly, you know, there's no sign of the chrysalis, where, you know, forget it. Now, what comes out of this is, towards the end, 130 or so, 130, Marx starts to sort of talk about the fact that the commodity capital is a more rational form than money capital, in which every trace, this is on 131, in which every trace of this process has been effaced, just as all the particular useful forms of commodities are generally effaced in money. That is, this goes back to the idea of money as a fetish. Money hides. It hides what production was about, it hides even what the commodity form was about and the specificities of the commodity form. And when we look in the next section as the circuit of capital as a whole, what we start to see is a distinctions within a unity. So that on 133, money capital, commodity capital, and productive capital. 
And then he goes on to define, the capital that assumes these forms in the course of its total circuit discards them again and fulfills in each of them its appropriate function, i.e. the metamorphosis stuff, is industrial capital. Industrial here in the sense that it encompasses every branch of production that is pursued on a capitalist basis. I think that's a very important paragraph. It, it says, well, how do, you, how do you think about these different circuits? Then what follows, two paragraphs later, the circuit of capital proceeds normally only as long as its various phases pass into each other without delay. If capital comes to a standstill in the first phase, M to C, money capital forms into a hoard. If this happens in the production phase, the means of production cease to function, and the labour power remains unoccupied. If in the last phase, C prime to M prime, unsaleable stocks of commodities obstruct the flow of circulation. All right, we're back to these are the potential blockage points. These are the points where crises can occur. Now, I think this paragraph is terribly important, even though Marx doesn't really highlight it at all. Because what it is actually saying is the possibility exists for many different forms of crisis to exist. You can, you can, you know, it can attach to money not being able to find any place to go, production not being able to be completed, or it can be commodities that can't be sold. And for the first time what we see Marx articulating is the idea that within the dynamics of circulation itself there is the real possibility of crises. And this is a systemic thing rather than simply what he said in Volume 1 of Capital, which is well, you know, you can get these monetary crises and they look like this, they look like that. Here he's saying there are systemic ways in which we can dissect the nature of crises. And I think this in notion of the interruption of the flow is terribly important. Now, in the enigma of capital, for example, I was arguing, well, there are all kinds of ways in which you can look at crises, there are all these kinds of blockages, and actually the language of the Grundrisse is very similar to this, which is that there are barriers which need to be circumvented. If you can't circumvent them or transcend them, then you get a crisis. And a crisis is one of the ways in which the barriers tends to get <coughs> removed. So instead of saying that crises only arise out of a dynamic of production, you have to see crises as potentially arising within the realm of circulation and that it can occur for all sorts of reasons in the realm of circulation. So I attach quite a lot of importance to that particular paragraph. Now, what this then gets into is some stuff about fixed capital and then there's some stuff about transport. Now transport occurs, comes into being uh, in a later chapter, so I'm going to delay consideration of transport till we get to uh, chapter 5, I think it is. But he concludes, I think, in uh, what to me is a very important way. On page 136, money capital and commodity capital, insofar as they appear and function as bearers of their own peculiar branches of business alongside industrial capital, he's accepting the idea that there are money capitalists and there are merchant capitalists. But now he's saying they really are simply bearers of what we're talking about here. We can understand why they're doing what they're doing through the analysis we're now conducting. They are, he says, now only modes of existence of the various functional forms that industrial capital constantly assumes and discards within the circulation sphere. Forms which have been rendered independent and one-sidedly extended through the social division of labour. So, in other words, you know, yeah, merchant capital are there, but we have to understand them simply in terms of the dynamics of what we're looking at. From the standpoint of money, he says on the next page, 137, it is precisely because the money form of value is its independent and palpable form of appearance. For appearance, you know, I always watch with Marx his stuff about appearance. That the circulation form M to M prime expresses money making, the driving motive of capitalist production, most palpably. The production process appears simply as an unavoidable middle term, a necessary evil for the purpose of money making. And this then leads into the bottom, he says, the money form of the two extremes, this is the independent and palpable form of existence of value. 
And for that reason, she says on the next page, money always appears as having an independent value form of money breeding money. The creation by value of surplus value is not only expressed as the alpha and omega of this process, but explicitly presented in the glittering money form. And he then has some stuff about work and consumption, which we'll come back to, but has a very interesting paragraph at the end of 139, little passage there. He talks about the way in which, for that reason, many states actually just like to assemble money and gain money, because it is the palpable form of wealth. So he says, we therefore find among the exponents of the mercantile system, which is a policy of accumulating money, which is based on the formula M to M prime, long sermons to the effect that the individual capitalist should consume only in his capacity as a worker, and that a capitalist nation should leave the consumption of its commodities and consumption process in general to other more stupid nations, while making productive consumption into its own life's work. Well, over the last 30 years, the people like Kevin Phillips and myself, I agree with them, we've been in a mercantilist situation with the United States performing the role of the most stupid nation. <laughs> right? I mean, consuming way, way, way beyond your means. The Germans and the Chinese have been sort of saving like crazy. And it's a mercantilist world. They've been assembling money power. And the US has been letting it drain away. And I think that this kind of notion of, of most stupid nation is a great idea. <laughs> uh, you know, we should, we should actually hang it out, you know, kind of say, you know, let's have a vote on the most stupid nation in the world, you know, and the United States is the most stupid nation, and then see what happens. Uh, but it, it, it is, it is that's just a wonderful little way of, 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 of looking at it, because Marx thinks that this, however, is a rather illusionary, illusory form. With volume one, we read straight through, essentially, and followed the logic of Marx's argument. But with two, you're interspersing it with parts of volume three, and that too, not always in order. It seems like we're reading it in a dynamic way, and I'm wondering how this aids us in understanding Marx's own way of um, abstracting in motion. First off, volume three is very thick, so if ever I want to teach volume three, <laughs> I'd like to have some of it already <laughs> taken care of. So, it's a little bit of that. Um, but. Uh, the other thing is that Marx, again and again and again in volume two, is talking about the credit system in particular. And so it seemed to me very important to see what would happen if you took materials on finance and credit and, and, and inserted them alongside uh, the materials in volume two. And it does, of course, all sorts of things. For instance, uh, what is considered a really technical relationship between circuits of money, capital, and commodity capital, and production capital, gets converted into volume three to an active class relation between you know, finance capitalists and production capitalists and merchant capitalists. Mm -hmm. And so you actually start to see the agents and, and the social positioning they have in relationship to these circuits that are described in very flat kind of terms in, in, in volume two. So for me it makes it a much more exciting text actually when you start to mix and match. Just to conclude this chapter, uh, we come to the argument the circuit of capital, as he says, 139, is thus a unified process of circulation and production, it includes both. But 140, the top, he says, the circuit of money capital is thus the most one-sided, hence most striking and characteristic form of appearance, again notice these terms like form of appearance, of the circuit of industrial capital in which its aim and driving motive, the valorization of value, money making and accumulation, appears in a form that leaps to the eye, buying in order to sell dearer. For these sorts of tangible reasons, the circuit of money capital, he goes on to say, remains the permanent general expression of industrial capital, insofar as it always includes the valorization of the value advanced. That is, you always know how much of the surplus value you've gotten. But he then counters this on 141 by saying, if we concentrate simply on this, if formula, that it contains in its form a certain deception, 
It bears an illusory character that derives from the existence of the advanced and valorized value in its equivalent form in money. What is emphasized is not the valorization of the value that occurs elsewhere in this kind of process, but the money form of this process. And then, bottom of the page, the illusory character of money going to money plus profit, and the corresponding illusory significance it is given, is there as soon as this form is regarded as the sole form, not as one that flows and is constantly repeated, i.e. as soon as it, take, it is taken not just as one of the forms of the circuit, but rather as its exclusive form. In itself, however, it refers to other forms. So, the other forms of circulation are, are absolutely necessary for the money form. The money form can't function without them. But nevertheless, the money form is the one in which we see more clearly what is going on. And for that reason, we are always in danger of prioritizing the money form vis-a-vis -vis the other forms of circulation. And it is, as he kind of almost says, well, it's natural to do that. And it, it is even, of course, important to understand that the motivation of the capitalist is very often about just simply accumulating more money power. But when you think about it, you, you, you wonder about that motivation. I mean, somebody who's running a factory, are they more interested in the money they get, or are they actually more interested in the reproduction of the factory? I mean, they've made the factory, they've built the factory. Are they just as much animated about, you know, keeping the factory going? Isn't that where the excitement is in terms of producing things and making things? And aren't the producers as interested in actually replicating and reproducing production as they are in making money? Why should we prioritize the money? But we tend to, for economic kinds of reasons. But I think it's perfectly plausible that the producer, the person who's involved as, as the productive capitalist, is, an, is as interested in replicating, i.e. in this production to production circuit, and potentially building it, and having a lot of pride in having built it and made it, and you know, and the monetary side of it, well, yeah, okay, can be a secondary motivation. But I think the general imaginary that comes with the nature of capitalism is, of course, that it's about money being used to make more money, and not caring at all exactly how you do it. Whereas I think what Marx is doing here is to say, well, it's not entirely like that. But it's perfectly understandable why it is that we might prioritize the money form, but we should be careful about doing that. Well, that's all I want to say about this chapter. Does anybody have any kind of questions or issues they want to raise themselves? I mean, I, you know, there are a lot of things going on here, and I don't catch all of them, but yeah. I'm just curious about where the subjective element of like <coughs> of labor power comes in throughout all three of these circuits, or if it's just in the sort of productive yeah. capital circuit or not. Is that I mean specifically I mean, you know, if it was possible to read volume one and try to understand that sort of like the objective and subjective uh, character of capitalist production in terms of class struggle and yeah. things like that. I'm just trying to imagine if there's like a, a subjective element to all three circuits and you can locate that kind of antagonism throughout the total process. In, in Volume 2 we get very little discussion of that. That's all Volume 1 stuff, you know. And I, I think what you're, again, what I said last week, you have to see Volume 2 as a certain window on the process, which excludes other, highlights certain things and excludes others. And it excludes much of that, all that stuff about the labor process and what, what's going on. And, the mobilization of the animal spirits of the laborer and all those kinds of things, it, 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 it excludes all of that. It just assumes that surplus value is being produced. 
And the interesting question is, well, how is it circulating? And that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at those processes. So you have to import into <coughs> volume two, if you like, a lot of the sensibilities that exist in volume one, uh, if you really want to, to, to see the total picture. Uh, but again, Marx has a very specific, I think, t set of targets in Volume 2, which don't include dealing with that. And there's hardly any mention of class struggle in Volume 2 at all. So all this stuff about the working day and the struggle over the factory acts, all those kinds of things that were crucial in Volume 1, Volume 2, it all disappears. It all disappears. Yeah. These three different frames, you interpret them in a way that the capitalist himself, I mean the, 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 the character, the type of capitalist, could, can have different interests according, it's not just always the surplus, uh, the, the pocketing of the surplus, it can, if you look then at the production frame, it could also be another interest. So a cap capitalist type can have conflicting yeah. interests, yeah. which might be important for alliance building. Or yeah. for this is the way I read it. Marx doesn't use it that way in, in here. I mean, I see it as, uh, well, this is, this is the site where finance capital operates. This is the site where the merchant capitalist operates, and this is the site where the industrial capitalist operates. So, yeah, I mean, Marx does say, yeah, interests can form around them, but they become bearers of the functions of, of the money, of doing what money can do or doing what commodity capital can do. So he's kind of reducing their agency, if you like, to, to, to just being bearers of what they can do. I think that is a little bit too restrictive, but certainly, as far as I'm concerned, it's around each one of these that political interests can form. And when I started out by kind of saying, well, you know, money capital can, can be like a butterfly and production capital can't, then the power relation between these different factions becomes very significant in understanding how a capitalist society actually works in a particular situation at a particular time. If producers were hege hegemonic, back in the 1950s and 1960s, and lost their hegemony to finance capital in the 1970s and 1980s, as many people argue, then that makes a very different world. And of course it can shift back again. There have been phases of financialization under capitalism before, which are then followed by, if you like, consolidation of power in, in certain production structures. Okay, so no other kind of questions. Let's uh, look quickly at the chapter two and three. Chapter two is about productive capital. And from the standpoint of uh, production capital, of course, circulation proper, as he says at the bottom of the first page, appears only as the mediator of the reproduction that is periodically repeated and made continuous through this repetition. Then immediately there's a question about production, is that are we going to take a part of the uh, extra money capital, the profit, and reinvest it in expansion. And he says, okay, let's make two assumptions. Let's imagine a situation of simple reproduction in which, as he says at the bottom of arm 45, the entire surplus value goes into the personal consumption of the capitalist. Now, <coughs> uh, chapter 23 of volume 1 is about simple reproduction. Uh, chapter 20 of volume 2 is about simple reproduction. So Marx uses an analysis of simple reproduction as a way to look at functional relationships. Uh, and it's interesting that, generally speaking, he spends more time on simple reproduction than he does on expanded reproduction. Uh, and he tends to look upon expanded reproduction as just a more complicated version of simple reproduction. Even as he says, simple reproduction under capitalism is a, is a, is a, a non-possibility. Non um, now, what's going on in this chapter is that we're, we're looking at the way in which money comes back into production, and there are two moments in this. I mean, the producer, the producer is here, and there is a, a, an MC moment that precedes what the producer does, and then a CM moment 
that follows what the producer does, and then this M comes back in, and that's the reproduction of the production apparatus and production capital. Um, now, what goes on in production, of course, is what he calls uh, productive consumption. This productive consumption rests on, of course, the satisfactory completion of these two moments of circulation, both money into commodities and commodities in, uh, into money. And so he spends a good time, actually, even though it's supposed to be about production, he doesn't talk about production very much, he talks about M into C and C uh, into M. This uh, process that he's looking at uh, entails uh, all sorts of ways in which if anything hiccup occurs here, then this, the production is in, is in trouble. Uh, so that any, any, any interruption here or, or here in, in the, uh, puts us into, into, into considerable difficulty. But there are also certain things that, 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 that flow from this. Um, one is that as this process continues, and I think there's some very interesting passages here, uh, as this process continues, he talks on, on 151 about, uh, and there's, a, there's an argument in Volume 1 of Capital which is rather, which is rather similar, uh, that the labourer in production is producing the equivalent of their own labour power plus the surplus value. And after a time, in effect, if the capitalist is consuming the surplus value, you can argue that they consume away their whole capital, uh, and that uh, labour actually has a right to, to the whole capital. And the argument he used in Volume 1 went something like this, you have, let's suppose you have a thousand pounds and you produce two hundred pounds of surplus value every year, then after five years two hundred pounds of surplus value is being produced by the labourer that therefore if that surplus value belongs to the labourer then the capitalist has forfeited uh, the right to the original capital and has in effect consumed away the original capital. This is his argument in simple reproduction in, in volume one, so that under the sort of Lockean view that labour has the right, pro has, has a, a property right to, to whatever they produce by mixing their labour with the land, uh, then under the Lockean thesis uh, they, they should rightly have all of the uh, all of the spoils. Um, so what he d then does is to look at some of the uh, features. So that uh, at the bottom of 153, he starts to say this: the money form, he says, appears simply as an evanescent form of value of the capital. As long as it persists in the shape of money, it does not function as capital and thus is not valorized. The capital remains idle. M functions here as a means of circulation, even though a means of circulation of capital. The appearance of independence that the money form of the capital value possesses in the first form of the circuit vanishes in this second form, which thus con constitutes a critique of the first and reduces thus this to a mere particular form. If the second metamorphosis, M to C, comes up against obstacles, if the means of production are unobtainable on the market, then the circular flow of the reproduction process is interrupted, just as if the capital was tied up in the form of commodity capital. The difference, however, is that it can last out longer in the money form than in its previous commodity form. In Volume 1 of Capital, when he's talking about the metamorphoses, he, he generally makes the argument that it's easier to go from money into the commodity, that is, to go from the universal into the particular, than it is to go from the particular into the universal. But here we see something rather different being stated, because the capitalist just doesn't want to go out and buy any commodity. They need a specific commodity, and they need a specific amount of that commodity. And so here we, they, and it has to be useful in a spe specific way. The steel maker needs a certain amount of iron ore. 
And if they've got a lot of fixed capital and there's no iron ore to be purchased, then they, they can have all the money in the world and it won't help. So suddenly we see a situation where going from M into C can be problematic because the specific use value that you need to produce steel and if you can't produce the steel and you can't produce the machine uh, that actually harvests the, the wheat and mills the grains, I mean, in other words, there's a whole kind of chain of very specific use values that have to be purchasable. And if that chain breaks down for any reason, then we get a crisis. And he talks a little bit about this uh, as we go on. So what he does then is to start to look at the material circumstances of, the, of, of these transitions. That M into C is not just going out and buying any old commodity, it's going out and buying a very specific commodity in order to engage in productive consumption in a very specific production process. So 155, he says, the transformation of money capital into productive capital is the purchase of commodities for the purpose of commodity production. It is only insofar as consumption is productive consumption of this kind that it falls within the actual circuit of capital. The condition for consumption to occur is that surplus value is made by means of the commodities thus consumed. And this is something very different from production, even commodity production, whose purpose is the existence of the producers. Such a replacement of commodity, uh, of commodity by commodity conditioned by surplus value production is something quite other than an exchange of products that is simply mediated by money. What this means is that capital becomes dependent upon other capitalists and that therefore relationships between capitalists start to enter into the picture. And the chain includes, of course, the worker. So he's got several passages in here, including those a little that follow on 155. The constant existence of the working class is necessary for the capitalist class, and so therefore is the consumption of the worker mediated by M into C. The same is true of the existence of other capitalists. Now this chain can get of, of supply and demand uh, can get mediated, and he introduces the figure of the merchant very briefly at the bottom of 155, and then tells a tale on 156 in which he talks about the consumption of commodities. And in effect, what we're, what we're talking about here is there's a title of a book by Schraffer called The Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. And what we're talking about here is precisely that, that commodities are being produced by, actually the productive consumption of commodities produced by other capitalists which introduces this whole notion of a, of a supply chain. And so, as he says, 156, as long as the product is sold, everything follows its regular course, as far as the capitalist producer is concerned. The circuit of the capital value that he represents is not interrupted. And if this process is expanded, which includes an expansion of the productive consumption of the means of production, then the reproduction of capital can be accompanied by a more expanded individual consumption and thus demand on the part of the workers. Right? Since this is introduced and mediated by productive consumption. The production of surplus value and with it also the individual consumption of the capitalist can thus grow and the whole reproduction process finds itself in the most flourishing condition. While in fact a great part of the commodities have only apparently gone into consumption and are actually lying unsold in the hands of retail traders, thus being still on the market. One stream of commodities now follows another, and it finally emerges that the earlier stream had only seemed to be swallowed up by consumption. Commodity capitals now vie with each other for space on the market. The latecomers sell below the price in order to sell it all. The earlier streams have not yet been converted into ready money, while payment for them is falling due. Their owners must declare themselves bankrupt or sell at any price in order to pay. This sale, however, has absolutely nothing to do with the real state of the demand. It has only to do with the demand for payment, with the absolute necessity of transforming commodities into money. 
At this point, the crisis breaks out. How that can happen is partly given in uh, some of the stuff that he's earlier uh, set out. 149, he says, capital presupposes the existence of the capitalist and this latter is conditional on his consumption of surplus value. Within the general circulation, C functions, for our example, as yarn, and he then talks about this as commodity capital. Um, but the consumption, he says, can be completely separated in time and space from the metamorphosis, and this is top of 150, in which this mass of commodities functions as his commodity capital. The same metamorphosis that has already been accomplished in the circulation of this capital remains still to be completed in the sphere of general circulation. And there's a discussion in here too about how means of payment don't necessarily coincide with uh, the actual consumption of commodities. Um, as he says at the bottom of 151, the difference in time between the execution of C and M and that of M to C may be more or less considerable. Although as a result of the act C to M, M represents past labour, N can represent for the act MC the transformed form of commodities that are not yet present on the market at all, but will, will be there only in the future, since MC does not need to take place until C has been produced afresh. And then he then talks about you know, coal may be purchased before it is extracted from the mine. The same applies to the expenditure of the capitalist revenue, I mean you can buy things, you know, ahead of time. And it's even true of the worker, he says, the worker may use wages to buy a coat that will only be made one week later. Uh, so that the separation of, of money flow from commodity, actual commodity usage becomes very much part of the story which leads into uh, this description of a specific chain of supply and demand uh, which then affects, as it were, or creates the possibility, not the possibility, but the probability of a crisis. Now throughout that first section he's assuming that the money, that the surplus value is consumed totally by the capitalist, which then raises the question of where does the money come from to buy the surplus value so that the capitalist can then have that money to consume. And there's a circuit goes on there in which the capitalist has to buy the surplus value before <laughs> they can actually realise it. So there's a very interesting kind of question which is beginning to emerge here, which is where does the money come from to purchase the surplus value? At this point, there has to be more money. Where is more money going to come from? And this is the question, and for the moment what he says is in effect that it comes from the capitalist. The capitalist has the money and therefore spends it, buys the commodity, realises the surplus value on the basis of that and then spends it again. So that in a way uh, the delta M is used to buy the delta C which is then used to buy, you know, to produce the delta M. So there's a sort of a, a, a circulation process there that seems to involve the capitalist class. Now this is not the whole story, it will become a rather different story a bit later, but this seems to be the situation as he's putting it now. Now when it comes down to accumulation and reproduction on an expanded scale, you see that you're not simply dealing at this point, as he says on 160, with the production of surplus value, you're also dealing with the capitalization of that surplus value into new capital. Uh, P into P prime, he says at the bottom of 160, is the produced surplus value being capitalized. But then there's a very peculiar set of passages that follows. On top of 161, as a specific and distinct form or mode of existence that corresponds to the particular functions of industrial capital, Money capital can perform only money functions, well he said that before, and commodity capital only commodity functions. The distinction between them is simply that between money and commodity. In the same way industrial capital in its form as productive capital can consist only of the same elements as those of any other labour process that fashions products. 
as industrial capital within the sphere of production can exist only in the combination corresponding to the production process in general, and thus also to the non-capitalist production process, so it can exist in the sphere of circulation only in the two forms of commodity and money that correspond to this. Now, what is non-capitalist production process doing in there? Marx seems to be saying that this whole process can in fact function without the production of surplus value. I don't know why, why this is in there, except that this comes back to the kind of question of the definition of capital. It is possible, of course, for there to be many kinds of production processes which are not about the production of surplus value. And it is perfectly possible to find those even within the, fa even within the midst of a capitalist social order. So the possibility apparently exists within this for there to be a non-capitalist production process, i.e. one that is not about production of surplus value and one that is not about a situation in which money breeds money, as he says. And so the capitalization of the surplus value can be the capitalization of a surplus, uh, which can then actually lead into expansion but not necessarily to produce more surplus value. And this is a, a strange argument to find in, in Marx's capital. This then leads him to look at the necessity for both the accumulation of money, that the expansion of the system can't occur on a smooth kind of basis, it often means you have to save money, so the accumulation of money, uh, as he says, if M is to serve as money capital in a second independent business alongside the first, it is clear that it can be invested in this only if it possesses the minimal magnitude required for such a business. It was ex invested extending the original business and the relationship between the material factors of P as well as their value relationship similarly determines a certain minimal magnitude for M. And so there's this question of the minimum size of reinvestment and, what, and how you save capital. And saving capital, of course, saving part of the money capital means you're hoarding it, which means you're actually disrupting the general flow. So there's a necessity to disrupt the general flow if you want to ho hoard the capital. And this of course is where the credit system comes in, and Marx doesn't want to deal with that here, so we don't get the credit system. Um, so the f he talks then on 163 about the necessity of forming a hoard uh, in order to be able to sort of launch into uh, these new systems of production, which leads him to set up some, some new categories. And 164, when this happens, he says, money figures here as latent money capital. Uh, and it's, it's being saved to be able, as a, as a preparatory stage, to enter back into the circulation process. But as long as it persists in the state of a hoard, it does not yet function as money capital, it is still money capital lying fallow, and he will use the term fallow capital not interrupted in its function, as in the previous case, but rather as yet incapable of performing this function. Now, what this suggests is that a part of the, the money capital has to be held to one side, both as latent and fallow capital, in order for the actual system to expand. So the expansion depends upon that. And then in, in 4 he outlines the, the idea of a, uh, of a reserve fund. Well. Uh, there's a lot of things that can go wrong in the production process, and as things go wrong, uh, so you need a reserve fund to cover them. So these are the sorts of issues that arise uh, in uh, the system of production. Production is contingent upon, very contingent upon, uh, the, the achievement of these other elements and the ability to, to take the specific, specific commodities and bring them into uh, production. Now, one of the surprising things about Volume 2 of Capital is this, that the circuit of commodity capital is very much privileged in Volume 2. Um, 
and it introduces uh, some very important caveats into the nature of the argument. So while, as he says, um, you can't open the circulation process with, with commodities, uh, the commodity element becomes <coughs> more and more significant to the analysis as the analysis goes on. And after a lot of things about typical sort of Marx discussion, what we start to see is a shift in the emphasis Marx is giving, and I think this is best recorded when you get up around 176, 177. Precisely, he says, precisely because, at the bottom of 176, precisely because the circuit C prime to C prime presupposes in its description the existence of another industrial capital in the form C equals L plus MP, <coughs> and MP comprises other capitals of various kinds, e.g. in our case machines, coal, oil, etc. It itself demands to be considered not only as the general form of the circuit, as a social form in which every individual industrial capital can be considered, except in the case of its first investment, hence not only as a form of motion common to all individual industrial capitals, but at the same time as the form of motion of the sum of individual capitals, i.e. the total social capital of the capitalist class. A movement in which the movement of any individual industrial capital simply appears as a partial one, intertwined with the others and conditioned by them. If we consider, for example, the total annual commodity product of a country, and, and analyze the movement in which one part of this replaces the productive capital of all individual businesses, and another part goes into the indiv individual consumption of the different classes, then we are considering C prime to C prime as a form of motion of both the social capital and of the surplus value or surplus product produced by this. <clears throat> in other words, uh, actually it is the movement of commodity capital which forms the basis of national accounts. It forms the basis of our thinking about commodity circulation. And it therefore involves us, as he says at the bottom of 177, in using this mode of capital as a way of talking about the total movement of industrial capital. The commodity exists, he says, as some particular kind of useful article. Every capitalistically produced article is commodity capital, irrespective of whether its use form destines it for productive or individual consumption, or for both. Now, the thing here is that the commodity is a use value. And you remember Marx's argument, a thing is only value if it is a use value for somebody somewhere. So the question of use value and the specificity of use value is going to come back in strongly with the question of commodity capital. And the commodity capital is has a very interesting kind of dilemma about value. A capitalist wants a certain amount of iron ore in order to produce the steel. And that is a quantitative relation. The steel production kind of says, in order to produce this ton of steel I need five tons of iron ore. All right? That is a material relation. And it can't be changed unless the technology of, you know, steel production changes. So that is a material relation, it's a physical relation, which then actually commits the capitalist to a value relation, i.e. I have to lay out so much in order to get that iron ore. Because the iron ore is not sort of, a, the value of it is not dictated by, you know, anything. It's just, it's, if it's dictated by the amount of labor taken in mining it and all this kind of stuff, 
If the socially necessary labour time is of a certain sort, then if you, everything exchanges at its value, then you have to pay whatever it takes to get your three tonnes of iron ore. So this then becomes, as it were, an interesting dilemma about the relationship between the value flows and the physical flows. And it's from the standpoint of the commodity circuit that you start to see the importance of the physical flows. Now this was already, in a way, set up in the section on productive capital, because productive consumption meant that the producer had to find commodities on the market that, of, of a very specific kind that they needed in order to, to produce whatever it was they were producing. So it's already presaged, if you like, in the circuit of productive consumption, but here in commodity production and commodity circulation, you start to see very specifically how this relationship is, is set up and, and proceeds. So it becomes a way of looking at the aggregate form of motion. And in fact, you can't look at the commodity form of circulation without looking at the relationship between the individual capital circulation and the aggregate. And he says uh, on 178, uh, C prime to C prime is taken as a form of motion of the total social capital or as the independent movement of an individual industrial capital. In all of these peculiarities, the circuit points beyond its own existence as the isolated circuit of a merely individual capital. And towards the end of the chapter, since in C prime to C prime, the total product, the total value, is the point of departure, it is evident here that leaving aside foreign trade, reproduction on an expanded scale, with productivity otherwise remaining the same, can take place only if the material elements of the additional productive capital are already contained in the part of the surplus product to be capitalized. That is to say, insofar as the production of one year serves as a precondition for that of the next, or insofar as production can occur together with a simple reproduction process within a year, surplus product is immediately produced in the form that enables it to function as additional capital. Notice, the language here says surplus product. What's the relationship between surplus product and surplus value? And what we get posed here is this whole kind of question of how does the surplus product embodied in the commodity get absorbed and by whom? I mean, if I'm producing a commodity which contains surplus value and I'm expanding the production of that commodity, then who is going to consume it? Well, that's predicated on the fact that the steel owners are expanding their production because I'm, I'm necessarily expanding my iron ore production, so therefore they must be. So this is a material relation, and it's how to absorb the surplus product as well as how to absorb the surplus value. In other words, this transition, which is about C into M, is about finding consumers who want that specific use value, and who want it in the quantities which make sense in terms of the value aggregates. Now this is a theme that becomes rather interesting as you go th through capital, which is what's the relationship between the material, physical production, the use value side of things, and the surplus product, and the production of surplus value. And there are times when there are some considerable tension between, between those two, and that's introduced here in this chapter. And he ends up with kind of talking about Quesnay's tableau économique, uh, which is going to be the basis of chapters 20 and 21 of Capital, which, of, of, of Volume 2, which are terribly important chapters, in which Marx, in a sense, sets up, sets up an input-output structure. You need so much iron ore to produce the steel, to produce the engines that produce the, the machinery, that produce the corn, that, you know, all those kinds of things. But that's a physical relation. 
And commodity, after all, commodity is a thing and it has these material qualities. And it has both a use value and an exchange value and the use value cannot be dismissed. And therefore the use value starts to come back in as a parallel track of argument. And you see it most clearly in the commodity capital. So this is the... Uh, uh, this, this chapter is terribly important. It, it's, it's the one where, where Marx really takes on some of these kinds of uh, questions uh, and begins to pose these kinds of questions. So I guess we're getting close to being out of time. So anybody got any immediate kind of questions? About this? Okay, next week, add any questions you want here, and then we're going to look at uh, the, circula the three figures of the circuit, circulation time, cost of circulation. But I also want you to think about how do you come out of this and define what capital is? based on this argument. Can you come up with a definition? What's the definition of capital? It's partly addressed in the three figures of the circuit where Marx puts all of them, to get all of them together, but you can already see some of, some of that in the argument. Okay, so let's leave it there. So thanks very much.